Well, this morning as we look at James chapter 2, we will be talking about one of the texts that is often used as a counter to what we consider as the crown jewel of the gospel. And it's really the crown jewel of the Reformation as well. And I think that's appropriate because this week is Reformation Week. Reformation Day is October 31st. And so as we are thinking in our minds about the Reformation, we should be thinking about the gospel. And uh, the most significant thing about the gospel is that we are saved by faith alone in the perfect work of Christ on the cross. In other words, the things that you do in life, the good things that you do, the bad things that you do, these things have absolutely no bearing, have nothing to do whether you go to heaven or not. The reason for that is because of our sinful natures. If, if God had this cosmic scale in heaven weighing our good works and our bad works, which is a view commonly held in most religions, that's even in the Quran, uh, the fact of the matter is we never do anything with pure motives. Uh, as Martin Luther said, that we do things with a motive that is kind of curved in on ourselves. And that's why Paul says in Romans 3 that no one does good. No, not one. And if that's true, if that's true of all of us, and if it's also true that every one of our sins comes with a death sentence, what hope do we have of earning God's good favor from these quote-unquote good works that are really dead works? Well, we have no hope <laughs> uh, in and of ourselves. The only hope that we have is for another sinless human to come alongside of us in God's court of justice. And that perfect human to say that I will take the Father's full wrath for your sin upon myself. To take God's eternal wrath so that we can be considered innocent by God, our Creator, and our Judge. And this is what Christ has done, right? Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, being truly God, being truly man, He was the spotless Lamb that could remove the sin, completely remove the sin of all who believe in Him. That is true substitutionary atonement. That is life for life. He shed His blood, which according to the Old Testament and the New Testament is absolutely necessary for the forgiveness of sin. And not only did He pay the perfect debt for sin, but He was raised again for our justification. And He sits at the right hand of the Father today until He comes again to judge the righteous and the dead, the living and the dead. So you might ask this morning, as many people ask, what can I do to be saved? What can I do? And the answer is, you can't do anything. <laughs> you cannot do anything to be saved because Christ has done it all for you. And that's the good news, brothers and sisters, is that Christ has completed salvation for you and you must accept it by faith alone. We repent of our sin, turn to Christ by faith, and that makes salvation a gift, doesn't it? It's not something that you earn that you can boast about. It is a gift so that God gets all of the glory. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's consistent. We see it in Romans 3.28 that says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians 2.16, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Clear enough, right? It's clear enough. But as... Football commentator Lee Corso says every Saturday morning on college game day, not so fast, my friends, not so fast. Uh, we have friends, don't we, and family members in the Catholic Church or in the Greek or Russian Orthodox Church that will direct our attention to this passage this morning, James chapter 2, and will ask us to answer verse 24 of chapter 2 that says, a person is justified by works. And not by faith alone. So how do you answer this? And this is a, a, a really great opportunity for us to be encouraged in our understanding of the Scriptures so that we can become better evangelists and apologists. An apologist is someone who defends the faith. And so we all need to have a ready answer to answer our family and friends so that they can understand the gospel as well, this good news. Now, a basic rule of Bible interpretation is context. 
Context, context, context. And so when we go to passages like Romans 4 and Galatians, we understand that what Paul is talking about with this big term justification, it's a legal term. In essence, if you were to define justification, it is a one-time legal pronouncement of righteousness by the Father based upon your repentant faith. Again, a one-time legal pronouncement of righteousness. That's the context of what Paul is talking about in Romans 4, for example. But when we come to James chapter 2, it is a very different context. If you were to look in chapter 1, verse 1, and, and you go through the book of James, you realize that James is writing to a persecuted people. It is a people, uh, the 12 tribes that have been dispersed because of persecution. These are people, and we, I think, need to stop for a moment and think what would it have been like to be in their shoes is to actually lose your home because you're a Christian. Because you hold to the Christian faith or Christian moral principles that you don't follow along with the culture. If you believe this, you're a danger to yourself. You're a danger to your children. You're a danger to the community. You're going to lose your property. You're going to be removed from the city. And in the case of these early Christians, this happened in mass. And so they are dispersed throughout the Roman kingdom at that time. And this, being the very first book written in the New Testament, addresses these issues. And so immediately, you see James talking about how you are to respond to suffering. Because these people were suffering. They lost everything. And he tells them you have to have joy in the midst of trials. And then he talks about how you deal with temptation, which often comes as a result of suffering. And how you are to give preference to one another. You are to love people and give to people that cannot give anything back to you. And so as we look at the book of James, we see it as a very different context than that of Romans chapter 4. In essence, he's talking about what is the portrait, or he's painting this picture, right? What is the portrait of true Christianity? Not just what you believe with mental assent, but how does that then affect your behavior, even the, despite the fact that you might not have anything? When things are good and there's no cost for being a Christian, well, the pews are full, right? But when persecution comes and the sifting happens, that's when we begin to see authentic Christianity put on display, and that's what James is talking about. Are you an authentic, truly born-again Christian, or will you be exposed as a false confessor? So this morning, in our context, James is going to make a contrast. This is two points this morning. The contrast between dead faith, which is essentially a verbal confession with nothing behind it, versus true faith. And so let's begin this morning in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 20, to look at false faith. False faith. James says, What use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. James says, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, if we look at verse, first, verse 14, the first thing that we see is an empty confession. An empty confession. Look at verse 14 again. What if someone says he has faith? This is crucial to understanding the context. It is this verbal confession of faith. And as we have the saying in English, that words are cheap. It's easy to say. And so it is with faith. Just because someone says, I am a Christian... What does that mean? What kind of Christian? What do you believe? Where's the proof that you can see? Well, it's oftentimes that you go beyond doctrinal belief to how they live. It is the, the power of a changed life. 
And an initial question we need to ask as we look at this is, what is saving faith? Is all faith of the same flavor? And I would say we cannot say that all faith as listed as faith is saving faith. We see that in John chapter 2 when Jesus had people that believed in him coming to him. And John says that Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in all men. We see this in the parable of the soils, whereas many people uh, make a profession of faith and seem to have great joy at the beginning of a Christian walk, later fall away, showing that their faith, their belief was never genuine in the first place. And we see that even in our text in verse 19, that even the demons have a type of belief, don't they? They have a certain type of faith. But would any one of us say that the demons are born again and will be in heaven? Absolutely not. So what is true faith? I think there's three critical elements of this, and church historians have talked about these things and theologians throughout history. But I think there's three critical elements. Number one... It is understanding the gospel itself. How can you be saved if you don't understand the content of the gospel? But is that all just understanding content? I would say no. That you not only have to understand the content, because a lot of people understand the content and they reject it as false. You must not only understand, but also understand that it is true. That it is truth. A lot of people stop there. It, well, it's an understanding and an assent that it is veritas, that it is true. We understand that, that it is God's given truth for everyone. But who has that kind of faith? Who understands the gospel and knows with 100% accuracy that it's true? Satan. Satan and the demons understand these things as well. And so there's a third critical element of faith, and that is a heartfelt trust and a repentant submission to the Lordship of Christ. Those are the three critical elements of faith. And how do you know if someone has this or not? And this is the struggle for every pastor throughout church history. How do I know if this person standing in front of me is genuinely born again or not? I mean, we don't walk around with red dots on our head for those that are elect. Well, James is trying to help us understand that, but there's another key term that we need to define to really understand this issue in James. And if you don't understand this term, you'll miss the entire point of the passage. And that is the term justification. Justification. We already talked this morning about how Paul defines justification in the book of Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. You may remember the definition I already gave, right? It is a one-time legal pronouncement of righteousness based on repentant faith. That is the legal form of justification. But uh, I think our problem is that when we think of justification in those terms, we tend to use that definition for every time justification appears in the New Testament, and that would not be correct. Because like in English, like in Greek, like in Russian, like in Czech, in many languages across the world, that term justification can be defined differently based on context. So what is another way that justification can be defined in the English language? Well, another way that it can be defined is vindication or proving a claim to be true by evidence, by evidence. So let me give you an illustration. Um, if you look at my prayer card on the back, and I'll show you tonight a picture of my family, <clears throat> you'll notice that a couple of my boys are taller than I am. And that's only happened within the past couple of years. And uh, so let's, let's say that there is a hypothetical situation where one of my boys says, you know what, Daddy, I'm taller than you are now. Uh, I, I can take you in wrestling. I can take you now. Well, what, would, what does every good father say to something like that? <laughs> okay, well, you, let's, let's see. You know, prove it. <laughs> prove it. Uh, and we might have to, as we say in the South, you might have to take him down a notch. But what just happened there? Notice what my boy said and what I said. He made a claim, a verbal claim. I can beat you in wrestling. And what did I say? Justify the claim. Justify the claim. In other words, vindicate what you just said to be true or prove it to be true. 
And so you see how there's different ways to define this term justification. And so you might be asking, well, what about other places in the Bible using the, the term similarly? And I would say, yes, there is. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, where Jesus is saying that wisdom is justified by her deeds. Same term used there. Now, is, is Jesus saying that wisdom is legally pronounced to be righteous based on her deeds? No, that doesn't make any sense. But it would make sense to say that wisdom shows herself to be true wisdom by how she behaves. It's, true wisdom is vindicated by her actions. So James' point, I think, becomes clear as we consider terms and context. If someone says, I am a Christian, it's a verbal confession, but they live like the devil, their life does not justify the claim. It's a false confession. It's a dead faith. It's not living. And so James is going to give us an illustration for this. Look at verses 15 and 16 again. <clears throat> if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? So again, think of the context. Who is James writing to? He's writing to people that have absolutely nothing. They've lost everything. And so this illustration makes very good sense to them, doesn't it? What does the text say? Does any poor person that comes to you, any person, no. What does he say? A brother or sister. He's talking about within the Christian community here. So what does this false confessor say? Go in peace, be warmed, be filled. Now, this can appear in the Greek language as either middle or passive. And so what does that mean? Well, the person saying this in the middle voice could be basically saying, you need to go out and make yourself have peace, be warm, uh, be filled. It's, it's all on you. In other words, you need to go get a J-O-B. You know, as they're shutting the door, you need to get to work. In the passive sense, it's kind of like this pious prayer with the hands up, Lord, may the Lord grant you peace and to be warmed and being filled, and meanwhile pushing you out the door and shutting the door. Both of them are infuriating. How could you do that to another brother and sister? Where's the I will be with you too part? All of that is absent. Where is the hospitality? And hospitality is a term I'll mention several times as we go through this text. Hospitality is distinctly Christian. So verse 17, James uses the ultimate <laughs> description for this type of confessor. And what does he say? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And you know, we can look outside in the springtime and we see trees blooming and giving off fruit. Why do they give fruit? It's because that they are living, but... What do you say about a tree in season that is not blooming, that it is not giving fruit? It's brown. The limbs are crumbling. Well, that is a, a dead tree. It's fake. It's not real. There's no hope for that. And James is using this illustration of death and fruitfulness to get us to think in our own hearts. Is, are, are we truly born again? Well, James emphasizes this empty content of this empty confession in verse 18. Notice what he says. Someone might say, so he's answering his objectors here. Someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. Here's the hypothetical. In other words, this person is coming to say, look, James, there's a variety of gifts in the church. You have faith. I have works. Let's just get along. I'm okay, you're okay, let's just plod forward. James' response comes in the latter part, part of verse 18, whereas he's saying, okay, show me your faith without the works. In other words, that's impossible. You cannot show fruitfulness without fruit. But he says, I will show you my faith by how I live, by my works. It's like having someone say, I can throw a football 80 yards and then refusing to throw the football. And then someone who says, yes, I can throw the, yard, the football 80 yards, and then proving it, vindicating it, justifying the claim by actually living out what he said that he could do. So brothers and sisters, faith and works are inseparable. It's like if, if I had a quarter with, what's on the two sides of the quarter? George Washington's head, and on the other side is the eagle, right? 
what if I came to you and gave you a quarter, and it's one half has got the imprint and the other half is empty? You would say, well, that's, that's false coinage. I mean, that's, that's not legitimate money. And so it is with our Christian walk. Yes, we have faith, but the other side of that coin that always works joins true faith. They are inseparable. Martin Luther said it this way, since we're talking about Reformation Week. He says, it is impossible to separate works from faith as it is impossible to separate burning and shining from fire. And John Calvin, the theologian of the Reformation, said it this way, faith alone justifies. Faith alone justifies. But the faith that justifies is never alone. It's never alone. So what will James' critic say next? Well, if you look in verse 19, he says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, James. I believe that God is one. I believe in the great Shema of Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Surely I am born again if I can say that. They recited that every morning, every evening. And I think today in contemporary evangelicalism, that could be replaced by saying, well, we recite the Lord's Prayer, we recite the Nicene Creed, we uh, recite the Apostles' Creed, whatever it may be. Well, James has a response, verse 19 and 20. You believe that God is one. You do well. In other words, I think we can see sar sarcasm kind of dripping off of this. You do well. Congratulations. <laughs> you believe that God is one. Guess what? The demons also believe that. And unlike you, false teachers, the demons actually show a response. They actually shudder. You say you have faith, you believe that God is one, you don't do anything. And so James is shoving this back in their face. The demons have a kind of faith, but the atheists, the skeptics, yeah, there's no atheists and skeptics among the demons, right? They know the truth, and they have a response unlike the unbeliever, unbelieving critics. And brothers and sisters, you, you can have friends and neighbors that, and, and even people in this church that have absolute correct doctrine, evangelical doctrine. But that does not mean that a person is truly born again. We remember the three elements of faith, don't we? That hell will contain people. And this is fearful, isn't it? That hell will contain people with conservative evangelical theology that have not repented of their sin and submitted their life to the Lordship of Christ. Yes, you must possess good doctrine, but good doctrine must also possess you. So here we see the, the, the quality is a false faith, don't we? False faith. Empty confession. It doesn't work. It's not compassionate. It's unhospitable. It's dead, superficial content. And ultimately, it does not save anyone. As a side note, I, I think it's interesting what James focuses on here. Notice that he doesn't say, you know, you're out swindling one another. You're committing murder. You're lying. All of these things. What does he say? You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. He's not saying you're doing wicked things. And that actually comes later. But he's saying you're not doing what you ought to be doing. This is the difference to, to, between the sins of commission and omission. Because a lot of people say that. You talk to unbelievers all the time. Well, I don't kill people. I don't commit adultery. And James is saying, okay, true, but do you do the things that you ought to do if you're claiming to be a Christian? And who is he asking this question of in verse 20? It's kind of offensive. James can be offensive, can he? He says, you foolish man, you foolish woman. This is very harsh language. Why does James talk this way? Well, I think he's trying to... Shake us out of our, our slumber. Maybe you've been coming to church for 10, 20, 30 years. You've been hearing the message over and over. James is trying to shake you out of your slumber and realize if, if your confession of faith is just that, a confession, and your life has not changed, that you don't love the church, you don't love the scriptures, you don't love to pray, you don't love to be uh, out doing evangelism, all of these things, you need to consider this morning that you are a hypocrite. Consider that option. If the tree is showing no fruit, this is an attention-getting device that James is using to offend us, to get us to think. But he doesn't stop there. Essentially, at the end of verse 20, he says, do you, do you want more evidence? 
Do you want to be shown, foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Do you need more convincing? And this is where point two comes along. He showed us the picture of what dead faith looks like. And now he's going to show us what true, living, genuine faith looks like. Verses 21 through 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Now, as we read those words, the very initial ones, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Hopefully, in your mind, you're thinking, okay, what, in what sense is James talking about justification here? And the knee-jerk reaction, I think, a lot of times, is that we read that term justification in light of legal justification. So, in what way is he talking about it here? There's the judicial kind and the vindication kind. So let's, let me ask you a question to see if we can't help with this issue. First question, there are two events in the life of Abraham here. Okay, what are they? This is very important. What two events in the life of Abraham is mentioned here? The first is verse 21, the offering of Isaac, right? And what's the second? Verse 23, when Abraham had faith, right? He believed in God, and it was reckoned to him, it was counted to him, it was pronounced to him to be righteous. Okay, the next question, which one of these came first? Which one of these two events came first? The first is when Abraham had faith, Genesis 15, verse 6. It's when he believed God. That's when God reckoned to him, imputed to him the righteousness of God, and he was counted to be righteous. That happened at the moment of faith. The next event occurred probably some 30 years later. Probably some 30 years later when Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, the son that he had waited for decades to see, and now God asked him to sacrifice his only son. This is where we see that second term or the second option for justification appearing. It is a vindication. In other words, when when Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, that was a vindication that his faith was true. It was showing everyone that his faith was valid, that he was truly a child of God. These two events in the life of Abraham, I think, show without a shadow of a doubt that we've got two definitions of justification here that show the key to understanding this passage. If not, if you're talking about two legal forms of justification here, you have Abraham being saved twice, which doesn't make any sense theologically. No, Abraham experienced salvation in Genesis 15 when he placed his faith in God's promise, and he exhibited the validity of that salvation 30 years later when he was willing to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. We're going to ask, why? Why is Abraham willing to do that? I mean, consider being in his place, your only son. And James gives the answer, verse 22, faith was working with the works. It was his faith. And this is not something that just Abraham gins up within himself and, you know, pulling himself up by his bootstraps. No, this is what the Bible says is something that only God can give, that God grants faith. God grants repentance. And not only that, God grants us the strength to behave and to act and to think like Christians. We should all remember the words of Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you. It is not you doing these things. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for what? For His good pleasure. And so, brothers and sisters, from the beginning to the middle of the end of your salvation, your sanctification, it is God who is doing these things in and through you. That is why Abraham behaved obediently as he did. And so, as verse 22 says, This is really the completion of his faith. This shows the fruit of his faith. Also in verse 22, uh, the fulfillment 
How is there a fulfillment in this text? It doesn't seem like there's a prophecy back in Genesis 15, but the fulfillment is the completion of his faith by obedience. Full fruition. So you see here that the issue is not that works save us, that, but that works are proof that our faith is genuine. Works do not earn you salvation, but your works are evidence that you have been saved. So this is why James makes this very bold statement in verse 24, and hopefully now you understand what he's saying here. You see, verse 24, that a man is justified or vindicated or his faith is shown to be true by works and not by faith alone or just some verbal confession. So let me paraphrase that again so that you understand. And maybe it's helpful to write vindication at the side there so that you remember the the two ways, the two glosses there. But James is saying, you see that a man's claim to faith is vindicated by his works and not by just a verbal claim that he has faith. But James doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with Abraham. And really, Abraham is his ace card. I mean, he's the father of the Jewish people. That alone should be enough evidence. But who does he mention next? A fascinating example, a woman, Rahab. Notice what he says in verse 25. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Now, at this point, Uh, you should be able to start thinking correctly about how do we determine that she is saved, justified by works. If if what I'm saying is true and justified can be identified or synonymous with vindication, I have to give you proof that she was actually saved prior to the coming of the spies, right? So let's look at that because that is either going to make or break my argument. So let's turn to Joshua chapter 2. And as, you, as you're turning to Joshua chapter 2, you will remember the story of Exodus when Moses is being called at the burning bush by God to go uh, save the people Israel. And something that God tells Moses is that I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will harden his heart so that what? You remember? God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that I may show my wonders and so that everyone will know that I am whom? The Lord, Yahweh. And not just the people in Egypt, but everyone surrounding, that everyone would know. And so this is what we're going to see in Joshua chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. This is Rahab's testimony. We have heard, and she's talking to the spies here, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. Now, let me pause there just for a moment. You notice in your text, in verse 10, the word Lord is in all capital letters. What does that mean? It is the covenant name for God. This is God's unique memorial name to all generations that we see that God gives to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. This is Yahweh. So it's interesting, isn't it, that Rahab is using the covenant name of God that is unique to Israel here. And she confesses that name. She says, we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. So she had gotten the message. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted And no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, Yahweh, notice again, all caps, your God, He is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by Yahweh, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all whom belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. Did Rahab believe? Absolutely she did. And because she believed, she was willing to do what? Not only risk her life, but her family's life. They could have all been executed for her doing what she did. 
So Rahab was judicially justified prior to the coming of the spies. And then when the spies came, her faith was justified in the sense that it was vindicated before others, shown to be true, genuine faith. And can I also mention a side note here? When we think about this story, sometimes we think that the spies were just kind of looking for a place and they kind of just ducked undercover and it all happened by chance. Did this happen by chance? Absolutely not. God had already been working in the life of Rahab to save her, to prepare her for this very moment. So two completely different people. Why Abraham? Why Rahab? One a man, the other a woman. One is the father of the Jewish people, and the other, she's a foreigner. Both are in the line of the Messiah. He was moral, she was immoral. Uh, He was a patriarch, she was a prostitute. He lived in the limelight, she lived in the shadows. He was prominent. High lifted up, she was low. Put together, they show us that the doctrine of justification by faith alone applies to everyone from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It also shows that the result of that justification is that fruit will naturally be produced no matter who you are. James is covering everyone across the spectrum so that none of us can say, well, this doesn't apply to me. Something else that they have in common I think is very interesting is that they both, Abraham and Rahab, show hospitality. They are known for hospitality. Abraham showed hospitality to the angels that came to him in Genesis 18. Rahab showed hospitality to the spies that came to her. And what a contrast. What a contrast to verse 15 of chapter 2 in James of the person who is not hospitable. These two are prime examples of how Christians are to be hospitable So James' last effort, his last effort to help us understand this in verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. He he turns to this picture again, a grievous picture of death. And we understand what death looks like in the life of humans, the life of animals. There's no movement. There's no sound. There's nothing. And James is saying, this is the way you need to think about a false professor. There's the seriousness of it as well. So as we return to our original question this morning, does Paul contradict James? Absolutely not. They perfectly complement one another. We've seen that, yes, justification does involve, at the moment of faith and repentance, a one-time legal pronouncement of righteousness, but also, how is that faith justified? How is it vindicated? How is it shown to be true? Well, it is a life of fruit-bearing, a life of faithfulness. James and Paul perfectly complement one another. John MacArthur writes it this way. He says, may I suggest to you that James and Paul are not standing face to face in confrontation, but they are standing back to back fighting two common enemies. Paul is fighting those people who want salvation to be by works. James is fighting those people who want a salvation that does not demand anything. Paul is saying salvation is only by grace. James is saying that salvation only by grace produces works. There's no debate here. Paul is defending himself against legalistic salvation, and James is defending himself against a libertine approach that says you can believe and have no change in your life and still be saved. (coughs) Brothers and sisters, we are to rejoice this week in the biblical doctrine that is showcased in the Reformation that you do not have to live your entire life in fear that you may or may not make it based upon your good works. But you can have comfort and joy this morning in the truth, the crown jewel of the gospel, that is that you can be saved by faith alone in the perfect work of Christ. And by repenting of your sin and turning to Him, even this morning, you can be guaranteed you will be saved. And as Christ was resurrected to newness of life and new body, we have that hope as well. That is the gospel That is the good news that we rest in, and I hope that it gives you confidence, and I would even say boldness, as you evangelize your family, your friends, 
and your neighbors how to talk about James and Paul perfectly complementing one another. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for your word. Sometimes things are difficult to understand, as even Peter tells us, but we know through disciplined study, as the workman works difficult, and our pastors and our elders and our deacons, as we study the word of God together, that we can discern truth, that your word is clear if we will apply yourselves. Thank you for the men in this church that are preaching this same message, to work hard, to labor hard in the ministry of preaching the word, but not just stopping there, but fulfilling the full role of a shepherd is to love the sheep and to guide them, lead, protect, to feed. Father, we pray that you would bless this church, may it be a, a light to a dark place in this country, and that you would give an excitement and a passion for evangelism here, uh, that you may be pleased through this church to save souls for your glory. And we pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.